using Latin characters to spell your son's name, a great interview with Noel Wilton, and we rank the Olympic sports. That's all coming up on the Heat Exchanger podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the pilot episode of the Heat Exchanger podcast, where we exchange hot takes with cool guests. My name is Jake. My name is Vince. And uh, we are pleased to be brought to you by the Bernoulli Principal, supporting the fluid mechanics curriculum in the Department of Chemical Engineering since 1738. Hooray for modern education curricula. So how are you doing today, Vince? I'm doing pretty well, Jake. How about you? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I was I was complaining before we came on about how I think I like tore my bicep in half throwing one softball yesterday because uh, the COVID pandemic has really put a damper on my physical activities and uh, trying to get back into it at 100% was a terrible idea. It's but, called aging. Yeah, yeah, it's called, yeah. So sometimes I need to be reminded that I'm two years older than I was when, when this whole thing started and all the gray hair might not be the stress of online teaching. It might actually just be the fact that I'm an old man now uh, with constant injuries. But I mean, it's okay. I, I had to go through physical, uh, physical therapy for a uh, rotator cuff because my daughter uh, slept on my arm for two straight nights. That's, that beats <laughs> me. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. <laughs> now, which the, the question is which daughter okay because like which of the three because you know depending on the age right like this could be either just like really lame or or you know if your nine-year-old daughter slept on your arm that that kind of makes sense you know no nah, it's my three-year-old okay okay <laughs> fair enough all right so we have a we have a good program set up today we have we have no idea what we're doing this is our pilot episode of a of a podcast we've looked up a soundboard and we've looked up some different audio editing technology. Uh, and by we, I mean, Vince has done all of that. I'm just kind of here uh, going along. But Vince, what's the, uh, what's the point of our podcast here? Well, um, part of it is just us shooting the breeze and talking about whatever comes to our mind. And then a part of it is talking about, you know, chemical engineering and um, about how awesome it is, I guess. Hey, that sounds, that sounds good. So we are going to have uh, just for, for our three listeners uh, at home, hey mom, uh, we are going to have guests uh, on the program each week or each, each episode that we release, I should say. So we do have a guest today. I'm not going to spill the beans a little bit, um, or I'll keep it a little hush-hush so that you can listen to her tell her story. It's Noelle Wilton, who is working for a biopharma company out of California. So she's going to talk a little bit about her experience in getting a job, uh, about going on co-ops, and, and tell us some funny stories about her time at Mac. Otherwise, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, current events, the news, you know, what's going on in the, in the world of tech and sports and that kind of thing. Maybe a little bit of video game talk. And um, we are going to do a weekly tier list. Am I right? Yeah, tier list. I don't know about weekly. Every oh, time we uh, upload an episode. Yeah, okay. A episode, an episodic tier list. Yeah, we're not ready. Yeah, what? You're not ready to commit to a weekly release on uh, July 20th of, of 2021 <laughs> when the school year is about to start and you have to teach all this Ember stuff? No? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, what's yeah. the topic for the tier list this week? Our tier list this week is uh, Olympic sports because Olympic is starting this weekend. So uh, we'll, oh. keep it, we'll keep it on time. Right. Okay. So. Very good. Yeah. Sweet. All right. So without, without further ado, let's, I mean, let's, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the world because I have some, I have some opinions. Okay. So, so Richard Branson went to space last week. Did quote unquote that? space. Pardon me? Quote unquote space. Yeah. Well, that's just, okay. So that's the first thing I want to talk about. All right. So Richard Branson goes to the edge of space. Okay. What, what does that, what does that mean? I'm sure that that's got a, you know, there's obviously a scientific definition of the edge of space, but I, I mean, I don't, I don't get it. Like why, why the edge of space? Why not just straight up space? If you can float, are you not in space? I don't know how this works. Yeah. I mean, I was doing some reading on this. NASA doesn't really define what space is, um, but it seems like he was up there for a few minutes or, you know, one and a half minutes up there and then yeah. keep back down so i <laughs> but like i i like that just 
it's, well, first of all, an amazing achievement for Richard Branson. So, I mean, no longer is he parachuting into MMA fights uh, representing Virgin Mobile, but now he's just like all the way up in space. And he beat Elon Musk by like 11 days. And this is a big deal, right? Yeah. Apparently. Apparently, Jeff Bezos is also flying up to space. Jeffrey Bezos. Yeah, you love, you love Jeff Bezos. Um, I don't understand the obsession with these old white men and, and going to space personally, but whatever. Good, good for them. It's, it's the new space race, apparently. So Yeah, or the near space race. Yeah. Know, or, yeah, get, get up, just pass a little bit over the stratosphere. Yeah, so you can't breathe and you would probably, I don't know, like, is there a, if you're on the edge of space, is there still an atmosphere or like, would you implode as if you were actually in space? Like what would happen if you, cause like I've seen pictures, right? Like he's not wearing a space suit. Like he's yeah. just kind of chilling. He's just kind of chilling, floating around. So I don't but know. But I mean, he was still in his rocket. It's not like he's outside. Yeah, I know that. But like, have you ever seen a movie Vince where they go to the moon? They wear space suits to like take off. Okay. That's fair. Like, That's fair. I feel like I feel like it had to have been pretty close, like hey, but the, 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 close to Earth to not wear a space suit at all. It's just like a glorified airplane. I, I don't even think they were high enough to get into orbit. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. So anyway, whatever. It seems like a colossal waste of money. But but reading about this brought me to uh, reading about our boy Elon. Okay, our boy Elon. Now what? what kind of a world do we live in in 2021 where we idolize people like elon musk like how is this the definition of success i'm sorry like whatever i hope i hope elon doesn't listen to this podcast i think the chances are pretty good that he won't but who knows but like how do we see a guy like elon musk and say yeah that that's the model of success right there yeah i mean i guess he's hardworking um i mean well, i've heard people that worked at tesla that like actually sees him there like all the time so it's really? it's it's i mean it's not common for a ceo to be like on the floor you know like so he got that going well that's that's good you know what else he's got going he's got going this concept of population collapse right this is his new thing and his so the space race for him the space race for him is not about just like going and like orbiting the earth or not orbiting the earth, but he wants to colonize Mars, right? Like yeah. the obsession is with the colonization of Mars because we aren't having enough babies. Like specifically the reason is because we need to have more babies, but we need somewhere to put those babies and all of them are supposed to go to Mars on his SpaceX exploration uh, starship thing, right? Yeah. The I mean, I mean, like the, he, he's a fr like for whatever reason, he's he wants to get to Mars, right? He just like Mars is the place to go. And then like, you know, well, we have all these people that are looking for like real planets that could, we could live on. But I don't know. Like, it's all sci fi to me. I, like, I don't think we could ever live on Mars, but I don't know. I might not be a dreamer like him. Right. So yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> uh, and they're coming out with a, a truck. Have you seen the Tesla truck? No, the Tesla truck, which I oh, heard, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard on the radio truck? yesterday that he's obsessed with keeping the model the exact same as the concept art, which looks kind of like um, if you were to give it the cotton candy paint job, it would look like a Porygon from the original <laughs> 150 Pokemon, right? Like that polygonal. Yeah, yeah. It's like the Pokemon that they invented in the era of the Nintendo 64, just so that it would look like it's supposed to on the Nintendo 64 instead of just like a harsh thing. But yeah, and then what about uh, Elon's kid's name? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You go, um, you go first. You go first. <laughs> for those of us, for those of us that are unfamiliar, Elon has a, a child with his girlfriend. Um, oh, Elon has multiple kids. Sorry, uh, about the latest yeah, one. multiple kids. But I just want to talk about this 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 name here. Are they all this weird? The names? No, nah, I mean that there's a Nevada. There's Xavier. I mean that they're like normal. And then there's this X. A E A dash twelve with Roman numerals. <laughs> <laughs> Popularly known as the child with one of the most bizarre nicknames in the world or names in the world, right? So yeah, X A. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say A, and 
Adzi, X A Adzi, maybe Axi. So so that's spelled okay. X space the Latin letter A E. So for those of us that are fantasy novel aficionados, whenever we talk about like the Aether, uh, they have that like cool like sideways A with an E stuck on the end of it. So that's that's one of the letters. It's actually the only letter space. A dash capital X lowercase I I. Right. Yeah. And now there's gotta be a there's got it's gotta be important that it's capital X lowercase I I, else it wouldn't like look like that. So I have no idea how to say it. Nickname X. By the way, Xavier, though, great name. Great name. I like the great name. name. Yeah. Well, like so Grimes, his partner said, this is how you pronounce it. It's just X, like the letter X, then A I. Like how you say the letter A, then I, apparently. Okay. But I, that's considerably easier than it looks. So yeah. like, how do you, okay. So when people like all the rage these days is like naming your kids after something crazy, some sort of, you know, fantasy ish name or like combination of characters or maybe naming them after, you know, a, a gourmet food or something. But like the, the question is, how do you justify that when your kid is six years old, five years old, going into kindergarten? Not that Elon Musk's kid would go to a public school, but let's just pretend for a second that, that they're going to go to a public school and you're going to go into kindergarten and you're going to introduce yourself and you're going to like write your name. You learn to write your name on a piece of paper. Are you doing them any favors at all when you when you do something like that? Like what would their friends call them? You know, like, well, like I would imagine that they would teach the kid to introduce themselves as X. Right. My name is X. Right. <laughs> but, but like, is that not confusing as a baby to like learn the alphabet when like yeah. you're trying to spell your name and you don't even have one of the 26 letters of the alphabet in your name. It's like something completely different. And, and it's just like, no, this isn't actually a letter. This is just how I spell my name. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's a combination of two letters. So it's like, you know, at least it's there. Yeah, I don't know. So one other thing, and I saw this a couple days ago, or not a couple days, a couple weeks ago, maybe I was watching an LPGA event. Um, it was on on TSN. It was uh, it was during Wimbledon, and I had Wimbledon on, and then Wimbledon ended, and I was just like chilling on the couch, like I usually do. And uh, and they had an LPGA event, and there was a golfer, and her name uh, on the leaderboard was Lee Six. And I've never seen that before either. So Lee six, like not L E E S I X, like L E E. And then the alphanumeric character six was her name. And I, I didn't know that that was a thing now. And like, that's not an, like this, this is a professional golfer, right? This person's 25 years old. So this is not a new thing. This had to have happened a while ago. And I also like, that's her name on the leaderboard. Right. So that might be a family name. So I don't know, like that's new to me. Lee six. Yeah, that's, that's he was up on the leaderboard. You can look it up. I, it's you know that's that's real life. But yeah, okay. So let's move on to this bullet train. So tell me about this bullet train in Tibet. Yeah, apparently uh, in Tibet uh, they got this bullet train up and running. It's uh, China spent five point six billion dollars uh, to build a high speed railway. Um, and I mean, it's quite amazing in terms of the, just the engineering of it, right? 47 tunnels, 121 bridges. Um, and the longest bridge and the highest bridge, I guess, is 525 meters long. Um, and it's uh, the first of a kind in the world. So it's, it's quite amazing. And, and we're talking about like up high in the mountains, right? Like way above um, the, the, sea level and so that they have to like the train has to have specific oxygen control um for for the passenger so it's pretty cool i mean it, i i think it's quite quite a testament to human um engineering prowess i guess i i, I completely i completely agree and so how how long is the is the rail line 435 kilometer 435 clicks that's amazing yeah. And most of it, oh yeah, here, I see it right here. Most, 75% of that 435 kilometers is either tunnel or bridge. Yeah. Talk about dealing with 
talk about dealing with adversity, right? So imagine, imagine that, right? Like you can't, you got to build something that big and 75% of the time you have to dig or like elevate. Yeah. And that one bridge, 525 meters long, says it's the highest arch bridge of its kind in the world. Strikes me as is pretty cool. It's got a picture of it here. Our, our listener can't uh, can't see <laughs> yeah. it, but I can. And, and, and I mean, like it says 90% of the route is over 3,000 meters above sea level. Just imagine the workers, right? Like they, they must have like massive lungs or something, you know, like... Oh. Well, that's that's just that's just Tibet though, right? Like, yeah. we're talking we're talking a Tibetan Tibetan railway. If it's not three kilometers above sea level, I'm like, well, what are you what are you doing? But no, you're you're absolutely right, and uh, and that's that's pretty impressive. It doesn't even strike, yeah. So it's not even that fast, right? Uh, 160 clicks yeah. per hour, 160 kilometers per hour. Um, so China's China's bullet trains typically travel up to 350 kilometers per hour, but of course. Uh, given the the nature of of where it is and like all the bridges it has to go over, that kind of makes sense that it can't go as fast. Not that I've, yeah. you know, taken a for free body dynamics class since first year yeah. physics, but like you I, know, I would imagine. I mean, you would figure um, with thinner air you could go faster. No, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I don't know. I think you have to reach some kind of threshold. You know, what? we should we should. Uh, Speaking of the Bernoulli equation, right? We should get uh, Dr. David Latulip on the program. Yeah. He could probably do some drag calculations for us. And, and yeah, on pipe flow. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we love we love that pipe flow in this in this department. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, five point six billion dollars, right? So yeah. that's that's pretty that's pretty cool. Um, would you like to know what, what Canada spends money on? Uh, so I just looked it up on the side here. Uh, some things that the Canadian government spent money on last year uh, to the tune of $5.6 billion or more. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, okay. So um, first things first, we spent 50 billion, we spent 47.2 billion. First of all, I shouldn't round things like 47.2 billion to 50 billion because that's $2.8 billion, which is a lot of money. Okay, so I'm not gonna do that. We spent. <laughs> $42.7 billion on old age security. Okay. For a country with 30 million, 30 million people in it, 35 million people in it, give or take, right? We spent $16.2 billion last year on interest for debt that we owe. So we spent three bullet trains worth of debt. Okay. We spent um, $14.6 billion on guaranteed income supplement payments. We spent, uh, what do we got? Oh, I, I saw something. Oh, we spent 5.9 billion on the climate action incentive, which by the way, so first of all, that's almost the same number. And the irony of this bullet train, as I just found out here, is that it is powered by internal combustion engine, right? So it's not even electric, it's not gas, it's not sustainable in any kind of way. It's just straight up a fuel burning engine uh, because Climate action is is not as important in certain areas of the world as it is here, I suppose. So that's that's interesting. Maybe that contributes to that low cost. But I'm wondering um, I'm wondering what kind of impact that's going to have. We spent uh, 16 billion dollars on national defense, which is which is honestly nothing, uh, especially yeah. when you compare it to somebody like the United States. Um, 15 billion dollars on indigenous grants. We spent uh, what do we got? And that's pretty much all like the interesting stuff. Yeah. And I mean, like we can't even get our light rail going. Right. So, well, that's so, so yeah. So let's talk about that. The light rail in Hamilton. Okay. Like what the heck is going on or the fact that, you know, let, let's, let's look, it took them a few years. All right. But, but China built a 530 or 435 kilometer, excuse me, 535 or 435. I've already forgotten. Whatever. doesn't matter. All I remember is the 35 for some reason they built this railroad through the mountains, three kilometers above the ocean, yeah. right? And we can't get an extension to the TTC, right? Like we're, we're incapable, like the, the urban planning of the city of Toronto is so bad that we can't get a subway line that isn't just a literal U with a line through it. It looks like a character that Elon Musk would name his, his kid with, <laughs> right? Like, 
it's it's got to be the most embarrassing railroad or and or like subway public transit whatever you like system well, for a major city at least oh it's just like... brutal right it's just brutal like you see these maps of of the subway systems in in japan for example like yeah. i had a buddy tell me that they went to japan and like they have little footprints on the ground this is before covid where now everybody's yeah. got little footprints on the ground so that you stay like you know two meters apart or whatever right but but like they had little footprints that were color coded because the the train system was so perfectly like tuned and so amazingly complex but the 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 diagrams and stuff to tell you where to go to go to a certain train was like so clear and like well laid out it had like little lines painted on the ground of all these different colors so if you want to get to a an entrance of that if you wanted to do a certain transfer it had like a way to show you like at the exit of this train this is the next train follow this line and it had like its own like special thing like because it's so complicated yeah. but it's easy to follow but we're not complicated we suck <laughs> yeah I, I mean like it's the same thing right i grew up in hong kong but we have a pretty good subway system there and like when i came here it was like well nobody wants to take the subway here and let's say i mean it's only one line you're, you're not really getting confused right it's just like you know here yeah. and there right like it just goes like, back and forth it's just back yeah, and, forth. and it's like so dilapidated compared to like real like real cities <laughs> so yeah it's like the train that they get on at the end of Batman Begins. Okay, so I'm going to make a deep throwback here. 2004 film by Christopher Nolan, Batman Begins. Maybe you've heard of it. But like the there's like the flashback to when Bruce Wayne is a kid and they had just built like the Wayne subway line or like the Wayne train line. Those those of you that, that are listening, you, you probably like weren't even old enough to watch this movie when, when it came out, but whatever. But like it's all like this fancy train system. And then at the end of the movie, Liam Neeson is trying to like make everybody go insane by driving this like radioactive or radio wave emitter into a water tower. And they're like on the same train and it literally looks like it's like falling apart. That's how I feel whenever I step on a subway line in Toronto. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Not that I've not that I've done that recently. <laughs> I, I mean, the New York subway is also pretty dilapidated, but at least it's a real subway system that could get you to places. You yeah. Know? And that's almost, at that point, it's almost part of the charm, right? Like, you know, yeah. depending on where you are. Yeah. Large rats. <laughs> <laughs> rats. But whatever. New York is cool. I've only been there once and I, I would love to say I took the subway, but I, I did not. I was there for a wedding. So it was basically like in and out on a, on a party bus, you know, <laughs> I didn't, uh, I actually didn't even know that you grew up in Hong Kong. So it makes me a terrible. Yeah, I, I came when I was nine. Nice. I English guess is, it's not, we're, we're not time. friends, right? We're bitter. We're bitter rivals. Didn't you uh, know? According to our students, we are bitter according to the students, rivals. You missed the memo that we are bitter rivals. That's fine. Yeah. So um, last, last current events topic uh, for, for you, Vince. So this is being taped on July the 20th. The MLB trade deadline is in 10 days and the Blue Jays get to come home to Toronto for the first time in two seasons, give or take. Uh, many of the players on the Toronto Blue Jays, George Springer, Hunjin Ryu, uh, some of the bigger names have never played a game in Toronto, right? Uh, some of the other players, Jordan Romano from Mississauga has never played a game for the main club in Toronto either. Right, because he, he really just made his made his hay last year. So the question to you, uh, Vincent, is: Is there going to be a trade deadline acquisition? What's your current uh, comfort level with the Blue Jays? You're, you're a baseball fan. What's your comfort level with the Blue Jays, and what do you think? I mean, the, the obvious need is the is the bullpen arms, right? Like it's just brutal. Like you know, like after the first five innings, you're like, oh, I don't know. Like if, if the game is close, it's like. You know, like we're in a one run or two run game. You're like, uh, like, I don't know. Let's roll the yeah. dice here. That's, so, it's, it's so true. It's so true. I, so, uh, like, I, I'm okay with them to, to let's just say, give up on maybe like a little bit of hitting depth because we have a lot of that uh, to, to, to maybe pick up a, a bullpen, bullpen arm or two, you know, like, but yeah, I mean, the, it's bullpen arms are also like hit or miss, you know, like. Well, that's, that's just it, right? Like it, it strikes me that the, the bullpen, first of all, necessary, although you listen to now there's a, 
the pundits and, and whatever, it's it's almost impossible to take them seriously because you know you listen to Buck Martinez or Muck Martinez as I call him um, on the on the broadcast, right? And they're like, oh, you know, Sandy Koufax pitched, you know, a 17 inning complete game in 1923 with 207 pitches, and like, why can't pitchers do that these days? And I think it's like the pitches like, at that time was like. 50 miles per hour. Like, you know, like, I don't think, I don't think that was quite, that's quite <laughs> true, but like, I would definitely say that the, like the intensity and like, it's not the fastballs. I think like you throw, you know, as somebody that loves baseball and likes to, to, to listen to podcasts of myself about the science of baseball and spin rates and like how you can like throw different types of pitches. I just think it's, it's the off speed. That's like ruining people's arms right like you you get your fingers around on that breaking ball or that curve ball and you try to flip that in there and it's just such an incredibly aggressive arm motion and like so bad for your elbow and they're trying to spin it so much because people are just juicing it out of the park all the time that you have to try to miss bats right like the current meta in baseball if i can use a zoomer term there for you um is is swing and miss right because like the there's a thing in baseball called like the true outcome, right? Like the true outcome is either strikeout or a home run right. or a walk. Right. So it's like, it's, it's the, the outcomes where the, the fielders are not involved. Right. In, in any way, it basically is just the pitcher and the batter and that's it. And it's so high, like the true outcome in baseball right now. I don't, I don't have the specific number. I think it's historically high, right? It's historically high. Right. And, and there's a couple of issues with that. It makes the game boring, right? As a fan, it's not fun. Like I like to play softball as you, as you know, and the greatest thing about softball is that it's like a baseball game where there are no true outcomes, first of all, except for the occasional home run. Um, And if you play like a, like a slow pitch league, there could be walks sometimes, I guess, but like, generally speaking, it's extremely low. And the pace of play is like, it's like an entire baseball game's worth of action condensed into 90 minutes. So like, if you're batting, you go up more frequently and you go up with a higher, like, first of all, you go up more times period because there's more balls in play. It's a higher scoring game, which is more fun. And even if you're on defense, like you're just on your toes more because it's just going to come to you, right? Like the ball's in play more and you're not just kind of standing around. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, I, I think r- runners on bases always makes it funner, right? Like it's just, and, and then just, you know, real contact and, and not out of the ball- ballpark contact kind of thing, right? Like it's just like, I mean, as, as a spectator, um, I find it more interesting, right? Yeah. Than, than, than just like, oh yeah, another, another home run or blah, blah, blah. You know, I, people make fun of baseball players, but they are athletes, right? Like they, some of them are so fast. Like anybody that says that a baseball player is not an athlete. I want you to go right now on YouTube and look up a highlight pack of Ricky Henderson stealing bases and how like he just embarrassed people's like ability to throw a baseball 90 miles an hour because he's just like faster than you in every way. Just like, dexterity is out out of the out of control right but like i want to see people running the bases right i want to see the defense like the the to me the best part of a baseball game of watching a baseball game is seeing either a base hit right so like a well-struck ball up the center or whatever or just to see a good defensive play there's a reason that if you like i don't know like espn runs mlb's best or whatever and i'm not by the way i I only see this like once in a while i don't mean to say like i'm this obsessive baseball fan but mlb's best is like the 50 best plays or like 50 best moments of the week and literally 45 out of 50 every time are defensive plays because that's the exciting thing right like good defensive plays diving catches or like picks and like wicked throws or like this like cool double play like that's what's exciting to watch if they don't they don't put the home runs unless it's like a you know a walk off grand slam or maybe it's shuhei otani like strikes out the side yeah. and then walks up and just like jacks a ding in in the next inning like other than that it's usually defensive plays that yeah that get the nod and and, and that's why people love like let's just say kevin pilar when he was around right like it's just the 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 plays that he makes right it's just yeah yeah and okay, so so what were the two? I'll I'll tell you, right? The two greatest moments of Kevin Pillar's time in Toronto was the the climb the wall over the over the wall catch, right? Like yeah. where he literally like grabbed onto the edge of the wall and then jumped over. For those of us that aren't baseball fans, like to catch the ball when it's not hit in front of you, like if it's over your the back of you and you have to catch it on the run backwards, is 
it might be one of the hardest things to do in, in professional sports, like to actually do it, especially in baseball where they hit it like 200 feet in the air and you're 400 yeah. feet away from where they hit it and you have to track it the whole way. Like it's actually so hard, but to do that while also jumping over a fence and like leaning over the fence is like, that's a once in a lifetime like moment. So, so that was Kevin Pillar's highlight. The other highlight of Kevin Pillar to the point that we're talking about with entertaining baseball is when he hit a single in like the opening game of the season, I think it was 2016, 2017. And then he proceeded to steal second base and third base and home plate. He stole home in the same like inning. He stole three bases and, and they scored a run and, because like the pitcher wasn't paying attention or whatever. And like, that's, that was amazing. Like I, I distinctly remember that, right? That's 2018 like, uh, apparently. 2018, thank you. Yeah, see, I mean like, yeah, I guess it's it's 2021. I keep thinking like 2016 was just a couple of years ago. And in my head, I'm like, <laughs> Kevin Pillar hasn't been on the team for two years. So it must've been 2016, but, <laughs> but yeah, like I, I love, I love entertaining baseball, but anyway, getting back to your point about the bullpen arms being just so volatile, it just makes me really like wonder how you can justify spending that kind of money on on a first of all it's a once in a while pitcher like sometimes you got a closing pitcher and you go on a bit of a losing streak like that that guy doesn't get into the game yeah for 10 days at a time or like if you do get him in it's literally to quote unquote get him work but like does that count really because like you're paying this this guy to be like clutch but there's no opportunity to be clutch so what are you paying them for like they can go out you're already losing by five like last night the jays were down eight nothing after one inning Congratulations, Ross Stripling. <laughs> Ross Stripling, by the way, one third of an inning. So zero point one innings pitched, eight eight runs against. That's that's gonna hurt the. Uh, no, actually, I think it was six. And then Anthony K gave up five or something silly like that in the like over the next one point two innings. But like that's gotta hurt the ERA. But Ross Stripling, a certified uh, stockbroker, by the way. So if you need, uh, if you need advice, <laughs> look him up. He's got his like stockbroker's license or whatever that is. I, I heard that the other day. So uh, strikes me as a smart guy. He seems like a pretty nice dude, except for the one time that he yelled at Joe Panic. But uh, Joe Panic. Oh, he apologized profusely right after. So. Yeah, because that's professional sports though. Anytime anybody does anything, they apologize. Unless their name is Novak Djokovic and they don't have to apologize. So, um, <laughs> But anyway, yeah, like the whole the, the bullpen thing is just is just crazy. And will you go to a Jays game if you can when they come back? If they're, if- I probably would. Like I, I'm like my wife, so Sam and I are thinking about like things we can do, right? So I mean, like it's, it's our 11th year anniversary by the end of August. So Jeez. we'll 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 do, we'll do something. Like last year we didn't do much, right? I mean, it was a 10th year, and then blah blah blah. But I mean, taking her to the Blue Jays game is not. I don't know. I romantic, think, like, it's, you know? Something, <laughs> it's something, right? First of all, 11th anniversary, you look like you're 22. So would you get married Thanks. at 10? That seems kind of weird, you know, yeah. <laughs> just before moving from Hong Kong. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Arranged, you know, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't hear me say it though. Um, I don't know. Going to a Jays, doing something, yeah. doing something would be great. You guys kind of got the shaft on number 10 then, eh? Like you, yeah. got, you guys got well, the shaft. I mean, we on. went to Niagara, but I mean, it is what it is, right? So yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, what was the, what was the last thing? Okay. This is the last question before we end the segment here, but what was the last thing that you did before the pandemic? Like the last interesting thing that you did as a family or maybe like just outing? Uh, well, we, we went down to the States as a family, uh, the summer before. So 2019, we, we went down to like Pennsylvania for whatever reason we went to hershey actually so that <laughs> like we went down to like pennsylvania actually we were in we were in michigan but it was like pennsylvania yeah S- similar similar yeah you went to uh, hershey that's yeah cool. we went to hershey picked up some chocolate you know <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a long ass drive to get some chocolate man <laughs> i'll tell you did you yeah, drive? no i'm assuming you drove yeah funny story so we went with our our buddy right um well, with my buddy um and they have a couple of kids as well so I went super cheap at Airbnb. I was like, oh, it's cheap. It's like $200 a night, like downtown Lancaster. So like this Amish town. Nice. And I did, I, I figured it's like, oh, it's pretty safe. It's like Amish, right? Um, <laughs> and then um, we went in there. It's like, oh, pretty, like it's it's a little seedy, right? Like it's like, uh, like uh, whatever. The, 
so we went out for our first day, right? Like what we went to Hershey, went to like a zoo with the kids, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. We came, we tried to come back home with, uh, to our Airbnb. Our, our street was blocked off with like cop cars. And we're like, okay, what's happening? And then, uh, so, so we, I walked out of the car and I was like, hey, uh, officer, uh, what's up? He's like, oh, yeah, there's a guy that got shot across the street. I was like, okay. Um, literally right across my Airbnb. So we start calling like our hotel and be like, hey, um, do you have a spot for us? And then so we had, we had to go, like, we had to, like my wife and my best buddy uh, had to go into the house, grab all our stuff and run to, run, run to the uh, hotel. Um, and then we try to get our re, uh, our thing refunded from Airbnb. Did you? The, re, the reason was uh, there was some guy that got shot across the street. Did um, you get a refund? Yeah, we did actually. Wow. Airbnb, I, I, like I was so surprised. It's just <laughs> that's in, that's incredible. I so I have a, a, a it's it's not really Airbnb related. Well, it is Airbnb related. So okay, in uh, 2016. Uh, that's when I got my, uh, that's when I graduated, right? So I defended my thesis uh, in 2016. And that summer, there was a conference in Slovenia, okay? So it's called ESCAPE, which is like the biggest, um, it's the European Symposium on Computer Aided uh, Process Engineering. So ESCAPE, look at that, it just rolls right off the tongue. And, uh, and that, like, that was in my field of, of study. And I promise it's not going to be about the actual conference because that'd be boring as all hell. But the point is, is that, uh, one of my buddies that was in the research group with Tom Adams. So shout out to Tom Adams. Also shout out to my boy, Jaffer Gauss uh, or G house as we call him. Um, he was obsessed in 2016 with, with getting accommodations via Airbnb. And our plan was not to fly into Slovenia because that was too expensive. And Tom Adams is cheap. Shout out to Tom Adams. Um, so we actually flew into Vienna, Austria. All right. Uh, we spent one night in Vienna and then rented a van. It was a Citroen work van is what we ended up getting. We, we rented a car. It was supposed to be a compact. And then they quote unquote upgraded us to a diesel Citroen. Look this up. Citroen's like a, a brand over there in, in Europe, like work van. Like think of the whiteout windowed Mercedes like work van, the tall one that you're always afraid someone's going to offer you candy out of. That's what we got. And we drove... <laughs> And we drove from Vienna to Slovenia when Adams showed up and we drove together. Except, of course, Adams doesn't drive stick and Jaffer doesn't drive at all. So uh, and since every car over there is stick shift, I had to drive the whole way and I was terrified um, of what I was doing. But anyway, the, the point of the Airbnb story is that we showed up and Jaffer's like, OK, I got this figured out. I got this Airbnb in downtown Vienna. This is where we're going to go to spend our night or whatever. I'm like, OK, cool. How are we going to get there? He's like, don't worry. I arranged through the host on Airbnb to pick us up at the airport, right? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> sounds fine. Like I had never used Airbnb before. Okay, so sounds like the beginning of like a horror movie, you know, dude. Like okay, so so I so I never used Airbnb. I've used it since. I've been I've had good experiences actually, but but this is funny. So so we're like, okay, we get out, and Jaffer has an international data plan so that he can text this guy for Airbnb. So right there, I'm like, okay, you've already like made up for the difference between Airbnb and a hotel by paying for an international data plan. But whatever, let's not get into that. And he texts this guy, and he's like, oh, I'm around the corner, go this way. So we like go where this guy says he is and we go into this like back alley next to this dumpster and there's this <laughs> old like Renault Clio like hatchback this like old car two-door car or 2.5 door because that's a hatchback and it's like falling apart and it's just like sitting there and this like guy gets out and he's like six foot ten and he's he's probably like our age or like 25 maybe ish and he's like oh hey okay so I'm gonna take you to the I'm gonna take you to the place and we're like Okay, so we, we pile in, there's nowhere near enough room. So we have our suitcases on our laps or whatever. And we start this drive. Now the drive to this place is like an hour and a half. Okay. And as we're driving, the guy just starts talking to us. And the topic of conversation was that he thought we were American, right? He's like, Oh, you guys are American. And we're like, No, we're from Canada. He's like, Well, I mean, like, you know, but do you ever go to America? We're like, no, I mean, like sometimes for travel or whatever. He's like, oh man, I want to go to America so bad. Okay. I'm just going to move to America. And that's what the whole conversation was about. Now, Vince, why did he want to move to America? This is my question to you. Um, what do you think? What was his really in freedom? You know, no, he wanted <laughs> to move to America 
in his words, which was the conversation for this entire car ride, just to bang chicks. That's all he wanted. Can he not do that at Slovenia or what? First, we were in we were in Austria. You gotta pay sure. attention to the story. But like basically, he's like, I heard that American women are just DTF all the time. So I'm just gonna go to America and just bang chicks. It's like the guy from Love Actually, which is one of my favorite Christmas movies of all time. And I count it as a Christmas I, movie. Again, too life. old for our, our intended audience. Dude, probably. okay. But Love Actually is a great movie, right? But there's that <laughs> dude from there's the guy from from England or whatever, that's just obsessed with moving to America to get an American girlfriend. And he shows up. And then on like the first night, he goes home with three chicks and it works out perfectly. And then he brings one home. Maybe that's his favorite, favorite film as well. The, yeah. the guy that... <laughs> anyway. Okay. So there's my Airbnb story. It's about how a guy told me that all he wants to do is just like get laid in America. And that's what his vision of America was. And I'm sad to report that he might not have been terribly off base with that. So <laughs> Okay, uh, should we take a quick break and get into our interview? What do you think? Yeah, sure. All right, sounds good. All right, we will be right back. All right, we are now very pleased to be joined by Noel Wilton, a recent graduate from 2019. Hello, Noel. how are you doing? Hi, Jake. I'm doing really well and excited to be joining you and Vince today. Awesome. Hey, so um, if, if it's okay with you, we're just going to ask you a few questions about your career, about your time at McMaster and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, cool. So why don't we get started with um, your program from Mac when you graduated, what your kind of story was while you were in school with us here? Yeah, so um, I studied the chemical and bioengineering program. So obviously after the general first year, I was really excited about the chem eng and then I wanted to sprinkle in some of that biosciences biology because I liked that in, um, in high school and I kind of had visions of maybe doing either engineering work or maybe staying in like the health sciences area afterwards. So that program was really exciting to me. And I was lucky enough to, to get accepted and get to join the great Chem Eng family at Mac. Um, so I started in 2014. And then I graduated in 2020. So pandemic grad, which was very interesting, but it was a great experience on a whole, I feel like I had so many unique opportunities that came from being in the chemical engineering department at McMaster. Um, I was really lucky to get to participate in a year long internship um, that really sparked my passion for the industry and allowed me to practice a lot of the things that I learned uh, up to that point. And then I came back and did my final year of schooling and then got to kind of enter the workforce with all of that knowledge and, and really found how valuable it all was. All right, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Now, speaking of, of industry, by the way, wish wish that we still had you around for recruitment because that was like easily the most shamelessly positive plug for our department that I've ever heard. So thanks so much. Um, so where are you working right now and, and what's your what's your role? Yeah, so I work at Biomarin Pharmaceuticals. They are a biopharmaceutical company in Marin, California. So it's just north of San Francisco, just across the Golden Gate Bridge. And our work focuses on developing drugs for rare and ultra rare genetic diseases. So the start of the company really started in enzyme replacement therapies for these diseases that maybe only had like a thousand patients in the US or less than 10,000 worldwide. So these really niche markets that were unserved at the time. And that really drew me to the company because it was satisfying a need that wasn't met by the industry. And that kind of has appeal from two standpoints, both kind of like our ethical standpoint and like wanting to help people that would otherwise be left with nothing. And also just the pace of this industry is a lot faster. We know, you know, working in any type of pharmaceutical biotech, you know, maybe besides what we saw this year in COVID, it tends to move pretty slow. There's a lot of barriers to entry. There's a lot of existing things to prove against you have to do like blind clinical trials and things like that, that just take time. But what we found in this space that Biomarin works in, because it's such a small patient population, we're able to move a lot quicker. And then you just see the science progress at a different pace and you encounter different challenges, I think. And so that was really exciting to me. Um, so I work in the MSAG group, which is Manufacturing Sciences and Technology. Um, so my work focuses on addressing challenges that are faced in our manufacturing group 
So they're making drugs that are already available to our patient population. So not stuff in our pipeline, but commercially available drug products. But kind of because things move so quickly, like I talked about, you know, we still encounter a fair few exciting issues um, that kind of get to evoke some of my chemical engineering experience and uh, expertise. And so I work on those issues in a lab scale. So that kind of addresses it from both a financial and like a safety perspective. You never want to try something out at the large scale because you could risk product quality attributes and also um, you know, there's a big financial burden associated with doing things when they're bigger. So I scale all that down and I run our studies on the bench and, and that's basically my day to day. That's fantastic. So uh, in terms of your job, like what's your favorite part of your job and what, what do you find uh, the most challenging? Yeah, I think my favorite part of my job is um, obviously the technical stuff is is so interesting and I, I love diving into the science and I learn so much every day. I work with such brilliant minds, both across engineering and, and scientific backgrounds. Um, and we really all have a patient based focus at Biomarin. And, and I really like that. They, they tie a lot of those stories and motivations into what we're doing. And because we're relatively small, we feel connected to that mission. I don't think we're as much of like a cog in the machine as, as a large, large company could be. But I think what I love is going, I'm such a people person and I, I love working with other people. I draw so much of my energy and my joy from working with others. And, and the people that I work with, I think are some of my closest friends and, and are what brings me into work every day and, and makes me do a good job is that it doesn't feel like work. It feels like fun. And, and so I think that that's what I like the most is just getting to work with my team and getting to know them as people and, and do good work together. The biggest challenge, um, is probably on the technical side. I work in cell culture. Cells are difficult creatures. Like, oh my gosh, it's like parenting, which I'm so far from being ready to do. <laughs> my bioreactors are always trying to, to harm themselves and, and become contaminated and die. And, you know, that can be stressful because you invest a lot of time. I run perfusion bioreactor systems. So they operate for 60 plus days. And that's sometimes a lot of work to just get yourself across the finish line without any major process incidents. So that can be the biggest challenge is sometimes you feel like you're doing it all right and something still goes wrong and, and it gets frustrating, but oh, well, that's life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, it sounds like your bioreactors are a little bit like my, my 4NL4 project groups, always just trying to self-destruct <laughs> it at any moment, you know? But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, when it, but when it works out 60 days later, I'll tell you what, it's quite the achievement. We, we love it. So you mentioned briefly during your uh, little spiel earlier on about uh, your co-op experience. Um, mm -hmm. And I got the date wrong of your graduation. My apologies, 2020, not 2019 because of that co-op. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your co-op experience, finding a position and uh, did it help you develop as a professional? Did you find it fulfilling? Yeah, yeah, the legit six. Um, not that it, taking six years could ever be illegitimate because I know everybody works really hard, but it was definitely a long undergraduate experience made longer by my internship, but all of it was really worth it. And at any point that I ever thought, um, you know, did I make the right decision in doing such a long undergrad? I think it was, it was validated by the excellent co-op that I got and now the excellent position that I have and opportunities that I get. So my co-op was also at Biomarin in the MSAT team. Um, I had a different focus at that time. I was doing more downstream work. That's really where my background was. I, I worked in the La Tulip lab throughout my undergraduate uh, degree at McMaster. And um, so I had a very downstream mindset. He does all like that membrane purification. And so um, I went in and was kind of the upstream team's purification intern. And they were like, you can run all of our stuff because we own your time and we don't have to ask them the downstream team to do this stuff. So it was, it was a handy play on, on their part. Um, so that experience for me um, was like so valuable. I, I really can't emphasize enough how extremely important doing internship was for me and my career. I think it, it had so many different impacts. I think one was getting to take everything that I had learned in those first four years of my degree and, and see how they applied. And, you know, some things I was like, oh, I, 
I don't remember that at all. And I never used it. <laughs> and, and then the other things I was like, oh my gosh, this is where it comes into play. And some things I had to go back and learn again because I was like, wow, I just studied that for the test and now it's out of my brain and I, I need it. <laughs> so I think it, it gave me that perspective, which was really important, especially going in then to my final year. It also gave me so many practical skills. I think I was very lucky to do uh, lab research with Dr. Latulip throughout my undergrad. And that set me up really well to go in and, and work in my internship. But being with an industrial company for a whole year, so not just four months, but get to spend that whole time, I was treated like a full-time employee. And I was given primary projects like a, an employee, very similar to what I do now in my current role. And so I saw kind of how that corporate scheme works, how to see a project through like end to end within a year, um, how to network across different departments. Like in my role at that time, I worked with the upstream people. I worked with downstream. I worked with our process development team. I worked with uh, our quality control people and manufacturing. And so I really had to, you know, whatever shell I might have come out of that shell even more and, and, and network with those teams and get what I needed and learn how to prioritize and, and say no to things. And it's not built the way that school is, right? It's not like you have a test at this time, you have a project due at this time, you really have to self-manage and self-motivate. And for me, uh, that that was a not a challenge because I am very hard worker, but um, it was a challenge because I'm, I'm so competitive and I love like a test or a, a thing, I don't love it, but like I love working towards something. And so to have kind of those open-ended structure that can be intimidating. And I think that set me up really well to figure out how to work under that environment. And then obviously all the technical skills that I gained. So that's really what that internship did for me. And then, you know, beyond, um, you know, just coming back to my same team, I think even if I had chosen not to come back to Biomarin, doing internships set me up with so many different skills and having that year already on my resume really opened up the job market for me when I, when I did graduate. So I had a lot of options, I think, because of that. Yeah, Noelle, I think you highlighted a bunch of really good um, experiences from the co-op, right? Like, like just learning opportunities that does not offer itself through school, right? And so um, a lot of our students are looking for um, co-op jobs. And, and we know that, especially with the pandemic, the job market has been um, down a little bit, um, to say the least. Um, do mm -hmm. you have any tips for students entering the workforce or looking for co-op positions? Uh, was there anything that work specifically for you uh, that work well? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I can empathize to, to some extent because I was a pandemic grad, but also not completely because I, I accepted my job offer two weeks into the pandemic. I think I accepted it April 2nd. So I really didn't have the, um, the foresight that was to come. Maybe if I did, I would have bought different stocks. Um, <laughs> But that's something else, I guess, entirely. Um, but I understand, and I have a lot of empathy that it uh, is a different situation and it's even more challenging for new grads than it used to be. So I think my advice really is to know kind of what your goal is, at least in the short term. It doesn't have to be your like 10 year goal. Like I want to be some like a CFO or whatever they want to be like a chief operating officer, like that's too far down the line. I think it's knowing, you know, right now, what kind of job would I like to enter in and, and not being overly ambitious. I think that's something that sometimes people my age want to do. Like I wanted to start out and, and be the boss and be a big deal. And you kind of have to humble yourself and be like, these are the roles that are attainable. And how can I set myself up the best to enter that role? And that's something that can happen really early. I hope it doesn't happen just in their final year of study. I think that can happen in first, second year. And you start to see what those job descriptions of entry level positions are looking for. And you start to tailor your skill set to that. And that can happen um, with or without job opportunities. You can get a lot of that, especially in our engineering program, um, in your classroom setting, in the labs that you do, in the projects that you do. I can't even say how many times in interviews I've brought up projects that I did or teamwork with different people in ChemEng or different um, like papers that I wrote or things that I read uh, that I've drawn on then to then talk about an interview that didn't come from work experience necessarily. So I think knowing what they're looking for and then looking at what you're doing and trying to tailor that to what that description is really early on is very helpful. Um, obviously as much as you can, getting practical experience is really important. So if you know you wanna graduate and you wanna work in a lab position like I do like as a research associate, 
um, you should try and work in a prof's group during the summers or, you know, after classes, if you have time to do two hours or do the thesis based uh, capstone or the, the, you know, the one where you can work in somebody's lab group instead of one of the formalized ones. And then you gain some of that experience, I think, in the lab and you have those practical skills to put on your resume. Um, Cause I think a lot of the time they do in those resumes, you know, have the skill finder where they're like, do you have mammalian cell culture? Do you have experience running an ACTA? Do you do X, Y, Z? So trying to target those. And then I think that feeds into my last or maybe my second last point. I, I love to talk a lot. So I have two more points um, is tailoring that resume really well and, and having a good resume. I can't say how many times again, like that I've submitted a resume and they've been like, this is a great resume. And I really didn't think that it's that hard to make. So I actually, I have two pointers when it comes to resume. I use a resume builder. I do pay for it, um, but you can get some good free options. But the one that I use is Novo resume and it, it's pretty cheap. Um, and it just formats it so nicely. It's a one pager, you know, and at my stage in my career, I think one page is all you should have. And it just like outlines it so nicely and it looks really professional and crisp. And I think people really appreciate that. They, they, it shows seriousness when you go in with a nice resume and when you've tailored that to the position. And then the other point is the cover letter. Um, I always format mine based on consulting cover letters. So the website that I use is called igotanoffer.com and they have like how to build a McKinsey cover letter. And then it's like a three paragraph structure and how you focus and you talk about like yourself and your major accomplishments and then like three reasons why I want specifically this role and specifically your group. And that format works really well. I think it shows such intent and interest. Um, and then the last thing I think is really leveraging your network, not being afraid to ask people for things. Like I'm not somebody that could necessarily get somebody a job, but I could suggest somebody to, you know, my manager to look at for an interview. And so it can be those little things. You don't have to go in and know somebody who is the hiring manager. It's just leveraging who you know and always trying to play to those because it is such a leg up to have somebody refer you into the company. You just get out of that pile. And especially now there are so many applications for every single role. Um, having that leg up, I think really helps. So that's what I would recommend, I think, to, to both people looking for new opportunities as a, as a new grad or people looking for co-op experience. All right, that's, a, that's amazing. And it's also nice to hear that you are able to maybe build some of those skills, even in the classes that we do have. You know that our department, we really have an emphasis on problem-based experiential kind of learning, you know, the whole learning for the sake of learning as opposed to just trying to memorize facts, which as you already pointed out, sometimes you just kind of forget them after the exam anyway, which is fine. You only have so much space. And, and with the advent of our new uh, kind of initiative, the, the process, we're trying to make sure that people try to take advantage of the opportunities in groups and the opportunities in clubs and teams and anywhere on campus to work on those networking skills and stuff. So that's great. I also really appreciate you giving some actual hard-nosed advice on, on the resumes and some services. Also, um, potential uh, future episode of the podcast sponsor. So, uh, so we really appreciate the free advertising there. Um, so one more thing from my end, school-related. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and assume that the answer is not Gauss-Jordan elimination. But nonetheless, I would like to ask whether it be technical, soft skill, uh, maybe something you haven't quite touched on yet, what would you say is the most important thing you learned in your time at McMaster? Yeah, <laughs> maybe not go see an elimination because um, I'm not sure that I was ever the best at 2E03, um, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll put it behind us. My other skills, Sean, later. Um, you know, I think for me, the one of the, like, this is me personally, I think you can't undersell the technical knowledge that's gained from our program. I think the chemical engineering program at McMaster is so impressive. The skills you learn, like just really stand out when you're out in the workforce. I think the things that we get from our program, um, whether it be from the core can, like eng skills or like how much statistics we know, or for me, like the bioscience, like coming in as a chemical engineer with, with that perspective is so, so valuable and really recognized by uh, my employers and and I think by my colleagues employers um, who have also graduated from McMaster Chem Eng. But I think for me personally, what I learned the most, I think, was how to work with other people successfully. I think that that's my greatest skill um, as an employee 
employee now is, is how well I can adapt and work with different teams and work to get something good out of each project that I, I work in, no matter who I'm working with. And I think for me, it's, it was always easy to work with a team that, you know, was hardworking and um, had the drive to get a project done. But sometimes it was hard if I had another person who really wanted to be the team lead as well. Like, I think I always like to take on that role. And so sometimes it, it was hard to balance like where I fit in each dynamic. And I think in all the diverse teams that I worked in, in the ChemEd program, we, you know, I worked in like the 403 class, you know, we had people from other chemical engineering departments, but also, uh, or other engineering departments, other chem engineers, and then even some people like outside of engineering that we got to work with and had to balance all of those different schedules and all of those different personalities. Like I think maybe in our chem eng group, we, we had a good personality dynamic where we all fit, but then you'd get those different people in there and you'd have to figure out how to balance that and how to still yield a good product. And that wasn't always easy. I can think back on group dynamics where I was like, this is really hard for me right now, but learning that in the classroom environment, learning that in school has been incredibly valuable going into the workplace because I think now I can enter any team and adapt and find my role and find how that can push the end goal forward. And sometimes that's not always the role that you would snap to instantly or like to take on, but it's the one that is needed to drive something forward. And, um, yeah, I think that I really gained that through my school experience and through how many projects and how many collaborative efforts uh, we have across our degree. That's great. I mean, like, you know, students think, you know, mass balance, thermo, all these things are important, right? And then, I mean, they are important, but uh, a lot of these softer skills are, are kind of sometimes looked down upon um, but, but by students or like they just don't realize how important they are until they, they get out into the quote unquote real world. So it's great to hear uh, you uh, and, and like, just based on your own experience to, to talk about, uh, you know, teamwork skills and things like that, right? So uh, last serious question from us. Um, do, do you have any final pieces of advice, professional or personal, uh, to the students? Yeah, hmm, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think say yes to the right opportunities. Like don't, don't be afraid. Don't say yes to everything because you don't want to burn yourself out. And, and that's not the objective is to be a jack of all trades, master of none, but say yes to things that are uh, challenging and um, exciting and different and, and then leverage that going forward. I think that that's something that I did taking the internship in California. I was nervous to move so far from home and to have a year away but um i i took a chance and said yes to that and it was one of the uh you know best things i think i ever did and um yeah that that's what i can say i, I don't be too much of a yes person because you'll get really tired but but say yes to those those really unique opportunities and and throw yourself into it as best you can okay so that was that was amazing that's that's some good advice and as we, we want to ask you a couple more lighthearted questions, maybe about your time at Mac, if that's okay, before we let you go, I'll just preface it by being indignant with the fact that every single question Vince asked, you said, that's a really good question. And I did not get a single one of those. So don't worry, I'm not counting or anything, but uh, I'm also oh, a little no. bit, uh, oh, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, um, maybe it was just, I was every other one, you know, I didn't want to say it too often. <laughs> So because you guys rotated, maybe next time for the next interview, you should, you should throw it up, like double up and then yeah. double up somewhere else. <laughs> this is going to feed really nicely into the, the theory amongst the undergrads that Vince and I have a bitter rivalry that we keep score with basically everything and that I'm already <laughs> losing. I'm already losing this fight and I brought it up myself. So uh, speaking of good questions, Vince, why don't you take the first one or two of the, uh, of the next ones? Sure. So uh, let's talk about, you know, McMaster and Hamilton, right? So can you tell us a funny story about your time at Mac? <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, I was thinking about this. I was like, what are, what are they going to ask me? What do I, what do I remember from Mac? And I was testing out questions. I was on the phone um, with one of my best friends, Natasha Reese Murray, uh, who, you know, was my partner in crime throughout undergrad and, and still is um, for sure. But I was like, what, what stories can I tell? And we were reviewing some of them and I was like, those are a lot of like, you had to be there. Cause they're not actually that, they're not actually that funny. It's just us being 
ridiculous in the CSTR and being like crazy obsessive. I think we we had some funny ones that we chatted about, about like walking home after the first two EO3 tests and just being like, oh my God. And we went and we went to um, the bean bar and we ordered like a wrap and we just ate it in silence. We we're like, that was so bad. I don't know what we're gonna do, it's so bad. And, <laughs> but that's not that funny and that's not gonna encourage anybody um, <laughs> to, to keep going. They're just gonna reflect if they're already through it and be like, that was so bad, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think we both did fine on the test in the end um, to, to let everybody know. We were being a little ridiculous. I can't tell you how many times Nat and I left a test and we're like, we failed. And then we were fine. Um, so we were just that kind of student. But there is one funny story that, that maybe you know goes hand in hand with engineering and liking to have a few beers after a rough time so it was the week it was homecoming of third year and of course because the chemical engineering profs are mean and third year is awful we had like a thermo test a mass balance test a what it, what else a, a mass transfer test a heat transfer test and then whatever one jake was teaching that year i don't know was it three EO3? Am I thinking it's two EO3, but it's three EO3. So that might've been the one that yeah. Nat and I walked home it's from. It's the one, it's the one that, uh, you know, that it's got the you one a wrap like. out of it at the end, right? It's a wrap. Okay. So it was three EO3. God, I was there so long. They're all blending together. So all of those tests and Jake had all those mean projects too with three EO3 where you had to like stay up till two in the morning trying to program something. I don't even know why. This is, um, this is not going all well. All of those things, all of those things were due, were happening the week after homecoming. Like I swear to God, we had six midterms the week after, the week after the weekend of homecoming. And Natasha and I are up in my bedroom and my housemates were all maroons and they were having like a rager on the main floor and we're studying flipping heat transfer and we're losing our minds. Like we're so mad. Like because we lived on um, like the main street there. We were on Sterling and Haddon and like people are just parading down yelling and there's party in my downstairs and we're trying to like do heat transfer and we're just getting progressively angrier. And so like at eight, cause we had to study from eight to like eight, really we could have gone eight till the next day um we were like screw it we're going out but then we've been studying all day and getting progressively angrier and I don't think you should drink on an angry stomach like I was mad and I showed up at the party and everybody was already like whoa homecoming and I was like yeah woo homecoming and I was knocking them back and um I was so unwell I was so unwell and then I still had to study the Sunday and write all those tests. And I didn't drink again for another year. I didn't drink again until after the fourth year hum homecoming, like not another sip. I couldn't even look at it. So it was so bad. So that, that's probably my funniest story. I'm not gonna tell the in-between of the anger and, and what led to me not drinking for a year. People can probably fill in the blanks, but I think that that was really draws on the chemical engineering horrors of third year. And, um, and yeah, how dedicated a student I was. <laughs> I won't. Uh, I won't comment on on all the the buses that just drove over and backed up over me and that. So um, <laughs> I do have a quick follow up though. Vince has another question, but really quick follow up, just based mm -hmm. on that story. Sounds sounds like a, a good time followed by a not so good time. So you know, that's that's. I think that's just undergrad. Well, it was a good time. It was a bad time through and through. I think. <laughs> well, uh, all right, fine, maybe, maybe. Um, so, so here's a quick question as a, mm -hmm. as a former alum and, and I'm allowed to ask you this question, I think, uh, what is your, what is your drinking game of choice? Like if somebody says, Noel, we are playing oh. blank. Mm -hmm. What are you always saying yes to uh, obviously like if you're, if you're drinking, I think I'm pretty good at flip cup. I'm, I'm good at flip cup. I'm really hit or miss at beer pong. I'm really hit or miss. Like sometimes I'm phenomenal and sometimes it's air balls the whole game. So I can't say yes to that always because sometimes I'm like, I don't want to, my partner will disown me if I'm terrible. So I think flip cup is my, is my best one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and are you saying that Chem Edge helped you to stay sober for a whole year? 
Yeah, whole year. <laughs> I was like, I'm not doing that again. It was just a mistake. Yeah. Natasha was like, why? It's so, we can do the both. She bounced back quicker. That that little thing, she's just, she's a firecracker. And so she could handle it all. I was like, no, I'm done. I'm out for the count. It was really funny. The next day she came back and like, we went back to studying and like, she was with me the night before. And I was like, I was like in bed doing the problems and she was at my desk because I had a big desk that we both fit at and we both had our chairs and Nat was like my extra housemate because we didn't actually live together until our last two years I was in bed doing it very very unenthusiastically but we still we still studied I'm Not sure fair. the epilogue is that you still ace <laughs> all six of the midterms right so yeah in the end you know I can't remember all of the in-between but the the final grades looked fine they they came out okay so whatever happened in the in-between we we made it happen with some blood sweat and tears and other bodily fluids you know all the things all right so a second question about you know Hamilton so so what's the best place to go um to eat or to socialize in Hamilton Oh, that's a, that's a fun one. Um, oh, sorry. I live on in San Francisco and I've lived right by the fire department and they're always going by. So I apologize for the sound, but the best place to eat or to socialize in, in my opinion, I loved lock street and James street. I mean, that's so classic. Everybody likes it there, but I wasn't a big like Hess village person. If the previous story told anybody anything um but I love St. James Eatery for breakfast I still look at their pancakes all the time like I follow them on Instagram and I try to recreate and they're just there to die for but I love James Street I love all the little vintage shops and like the breweries and um we spent a number of times at August 8 eating all you can eat sushi at the end of exam season with all the the Kemenge fam and so I love that. And then Lock Street is the same, super cute. I love the Sima, the Italian restaurant. Actually, the day that the pandemic was announced, Natasha and I were like, well, what are we going to do? The school's closed. I guess let's go for lunch. And we went to Sima and we had like a three course lunch meal. And we we're like, huh, we didn't know that was the last time we we're going to eat inside for a year and a half. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think those are my two favorite spots. But closer to Mac, I really love Saigon Village. I still fantasize about their uh, pork and shallots dumplings with some pho. I would eat that like once a week, which was the best. Okay, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I think uh, I'm I'm with you. Obviously, I'm an old bitter man, uh, and we have I have a lot more gray hairs as we talked about before we started the taping of this episode. So like, I'm not going to No Hess Village or whatever, but uh, but I do like I do like Augusta or, or Lock Street. I like Mesa yeah. too. I don't know if you've ever been to Mesa, but shout out to Mesa, the Mexican restaurant on uh, James Street North towards the oh, water. Oh, yes. There. Okay. I know. Yeah. yeah. Do they have the upstairs and the downstairs? Like, is there I, one under? I've only ever been on the main floor, to be honest. Okay. I'm not even really sure, but um, I think I've been there. I think I've yeah, been there. It's a bit unassuming. It just kind of looks like kind yeah. of a standard, you know, not too fancy, but man, they have great food and good value, uh, which yeah. is always what I'm looking for when I eat out too. All right. So last, last uh, rapid fire series before we let you go. Okay. So uh, as a part of our usual podcast programming, we're going to be doing some tiered lists every week. I don't know if you're familiar with the internet rage, uh, all the rage these days, I should say, not internet rage, there's almost too much I'd have to keep track of, but, <laughs> but all the rage are these tiered lists where, where you kind of have a topic and you, and you go through and you rate things. So uh, we will be rating things on your standard scale. So it's a, it's a typical academic scale, A, B, C, D, F. Uh, and then above an A is your S tier. So it's your like top thing. So before Vince and I get into it and fight about, um, you know, the merits of, of long distance running, uh, we'd like to get your, your take on, on a couple of these. Is that okay? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So give me, give me your rating and a, and a really quick, uh, maybe 30 second or 60 second justification for um, the triathlon. Oh, okay. Um, I think that would have to be like a, a D that's mean, but I think it, athletics and all of that, it's like so hardcore Bravo to those people. Very tough. But I, just to watch it, I'm like, Oh, I don't have the stamina to watch this. See, it's not fast it, enough for me. I love to hear it because you know, long distance running, I can't do it right. Or long distance swimming and biking. Let's be honest, right. It's all those yeah. things. I can't do those things. So, so you're right. Cause, cause we have to rate these things. I forgot to mention, but you're right. We have to rate them, not just on the athletic feet, but also do you as a consumer of, you know, sports television or, or whatever, do you care or can you watch it? And um, 
Yeah, I, I, I have to agree with you on that one. Like anything involving long distance running or long distance biking, I just can't really watch it. And this is coming from a guy that watches golf all the time. Okay. So like, <laughs> let's, obviously let's, let's take that with a grain of salt. Okay. So uh, what about diving? Oh, I like diving. I would give diving an A. I think it, it happens quickly. Um, I think it's incredible how they can like contort themselves and jump from so high up. I'm kind of nervous of heights. Like thinking about it makes me feel sick. Um, but I like to watch them do it. And um, yeah, I think it's so impressive. It's very exciting. I like watching for no splash. That's the only thing that I know that is like good, but I would give it an A. Do you have a do you have a particular diving event that is your favorite? We're kind of grouping things together at the macro. No, level. I like when they dive from high up, so then they can do a lot of flips, like not like the shallow diving stuff. Like go higher, flip more times. Nice, nice. Okay, uh, so we have an A and a D. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, last but certainly not least, what about equestrian events? <laughs> Jake put this in on purpose because I think I actually missed one of the rewrites for a test to go and watch a horse show um, because I am an equestrian myself. So not like a horse, but like an equestrian like competitor. <laughs> I'm actually a horse. I've given this whole interview as a horse. Um, some, some people who called me a crazy horse girl as a kid are gonna like make fun of this. Um, but yeah, I would give that an S. I love watching it because, but I think that's personally motivated. So for me, um, it's the sport that I do. So I like to see it, but I think for everybody else, it's like, they jump over really high things. It's like almost six feet, the, the height of the jumps. It's very fast. Canada's really good at it. I don't know what other arguments I can get. Hey, it sounds like you're selling it pretty good for, for those of us that'll be getting up at, at heaven's knows what hour, uh, in order, yeah. in order to do that. Right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I didn't remember that you you skipped any rewrites or whatever, but chances are you didn't need the rewrite anyway. So that, that was an S for equestrian. Yeah. Yeah, that's my S. <laughs> the, the one memory I have of you, Noel, the, the first, like I taught you to Geo3. And I remember mm -hmm. distinctly that that you came, you came to my class with a black guy. I was like, hey, what happened? And then you got kicked oh, in the face by a horse. I got kicked in the face. That wasn't second year. I did. I fractured my jaw actually. And um, it that was a bad horse. Like that was not my fault. That was a mean horse. I went to like clip her face to like, like, like with the lead line to bring her inside. And she flipped around and she booted me in the head. And that's the first time. That's the only time that's ever happened to me. So don't let that deter you folks. Everybody who is going to take up riding after this. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. All right. Uh, Noel, that's, that's probably all the time we have. We, you've been super generous with your time and very, very good with all of your answers. So thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. Oh, and by the way, uh, all of your friends that called you a crazy horse lady, your words, not mine. Uh, don't worry. Vince <laughs> and my mom were not those friends and they're the only two people that are going to listen to this podcast. So I think so you'll be safe. fine. You're not, uh, you're not broadcasting. This <laughs> Um, okay. Hey, uh, hey, thanks. Thanks so much for, for all of this and for calling in all the way from California. We really appreciate it. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you guys so much. And to everybody listening, uh, hopefully besides Jake and Vince's moms, because uh, they might not want it, but like, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. It's Noelle Wilton or uh, yeah, send me a message there if you have any follow-up questions, but um, congrats on going to school at McMaster in Kevenge, I think it's the best. And, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thanks, Noel, you take care of yourself. Yeah, thanks, Noel. Thank you. All right, uh, welcome back to um, our mm -hmm. podcast. Like we said at the very beginning, we will have um, an episodic uh, tier list every time. And uh, today we are doing a tier list of Olympic sports. O Olympics are starting in um, uh, three days from now. I guess we're taping on the 20th of July. Um, it will start July 23rd from what I gather. So uh, we'll talk about some of our um, Olympic sports. Uh, not all of them because there's a lot. We will group some together. Uh, but we will do a tier list. And how uh, we're going to do it is... Uh, we'll rate, we'll rate it, uh, we'll rank it the, the normal way, um, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then if they're really good, then there's an S tier as well. 
Um, and uh, what are some criteria that we're ranking our sports uh, on, Jake? Uh, yeah, so uh, are we doing an E? I thought we were just replacing E with F to go like all academic, you know, like A, B, C, D, F, and then also S, like uh, Samuel as the as the top tier, because like we like to trigger we like to trigger students by <laughs> by having a, an F an F class that's available. So our criteria are there's three things here because uh, we are doing this as fans, okay? We are not doing this as actual participants in the event. So we are going to rate things based, first of all, on the athletic achievement or the athletic rigor. So like how impressive is it what they actually do um, in, in our opinion, which of course, obviously all of this is, is our opinion. So if you're like an Olympic weightlifter and we tell you that weightlifting sucks, uh, please don't take offense. It's just because we're weak and, and lame. We're also doing it based on the watchability or the entertainment factor. So like if you've turned on the TV or if you go to the actual event or whatever, which of course you can't do this year, but um, like you're flipping through the different TSN channels, right? One through five. And you say to yourself, like you, you land on this thing, how likely are you to stay on that thing and like watch it? Um, and then last but not least, it's the actual like competitiveness. So like, is it actually a tight competition? Is there good country representation? And is there specifically, is there good Canadian representation? Cause we want to see some good Canadian content, right? So like if, uh, if Canada has skin in the game there, then we would say uh, that that's a good one. Cool. And we are definitely, um, as, as Vince said, grouping things together in a very macro level. So like, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to do things like, I don't know, like I said, like weightlifting, like there's like a hundred different types of weightlifting. So let's, let's not get into the semantics about like different types and like how deadlifting is more entertaining than, than, I don't know, shot put, which I guess doesn't count as weightlifting, but like, you know, so we won't worry about that. All right, Vince, uh, you're going to go first. All right. Sure. Okay. So um, your, your event, I'll give you your event and you can, and you can, uh, you can rate it. So your event is the swimming events. Yeah. Oh, for me, swimming, um, definitely an A or an S. Um, I, I really enjoy swimming. I, I personally can't swim. My, my, my kids are taking swimming lessons, but I personally can't swim. But um, I don't know. I, I think it's exciting. Um, I remember a few years ago with like Michael Phelps and whatnot, like I would watch a lot of the swimming, um, like mm -hmm. just a lot of the swimming events. Um, I mean, the sh shorter distance. And then I mean, like last last time around uh, with uh, Penny, um, what's her last name? Alexiak. Alexiak. Yeah. Her, her brother plays for the right. Star which, Show. which there was huge backlash from like people just interviewing Penny Alexiak about her brother instead of about herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, um, so can, the Canadians are in the game, um, but yeah, like it, it's super exciting. Um, it takes, I mean, the shorter distances takes like, you know, a couple of minutes, right? So it's, it's watchable for me. Yeah. And so, and then my kids love it. I, I like, we'll sit and, and, and watch, watch it together. So um, if I had to choose probably an S, maybe I'm really? being a little bit, nice you know that's uh s for swimming right yeah, so s for swimming that's that's aggressive i mean like an s an s to me is like a one one per list gets the s so there you go to me uh to me swimming is, is good i'm going to agree with you on the watchability and on the canadian content um i like watching the swimming i think it's like watching it's it's a race but it's a slow race right and no disrespect to the swimmers they're swimming very fast but you can't swim very fast relative to like running and stuff right so like there's a lot of kind of like slowly get up off your seat if it's a tight race like towards the end like with you know 20 meters to go if people are neck and neck that last 20 meters lasts a long time and it's very exciting to like try to see like who's actually going to make it right so i'll give swimming an a i'll, I'll agree with you that it goes up and, and you give it the a but Fantastic. You, can, you can give it the s yeah um so for you jake we'll, we'll stick with water right and um how, how would you how would you rank diving? Okay, so so diving. So our guest on on the podcast, Noel, gave diving an A, I think, right? So she she likes the diving, and I am going to agree with her. And I know that that means we've got two uh, high ranking things out the gate. But I actually am ready to say that diving is my favorite Olympic event to watch. I love diving. I I'm not going to give it the S because uh, I I think I don't know like. 
depending on the mood, I might flip to something else depending on, on what's on. But, but generally speaking, if you needed something to like entertain me, I love the diving. I think it's fast paced. I think depending on the variety of the event. Uh, so like the, the high board versus the springboard, you know, all those different things, um, watching for no splash and stuff and like seeing what the actual numbers are, the anticipation, it's kind of like a, you know, the ice dancing routine, the anticipation of seeing the scores afterwards where they like show you the breakdown and like what ones they threw off the record or whatever. I love, I love watching diving uh, men's and women's. I think they both do a, it's just amazing. And there's always in terms of the entertainment factor, right? Now the Canadian side, maybe not so great with the diving, but in terms of the entertainment factor, right? There is always the chance that there's going to be a spectacular failure, right? And like, you feel bad for the person that like yard sales on a, on a dive, just like belly flops. But that doesn't mean it's like watching NASCAR for, you know, assuming everybody feels okay, right? It's like watching NASCAR for the prang, right? For the crash. It's just like you want to see something funny. And diving has that potential to like see something funny. So I love diving. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, diving will probably be a, a or a B for me as well. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know the technical part. Like, I, I mean, like the, the, the only thing that, that kind of turns me off with this, these type of events is the judging. Cause like, I have no idea how judging works. Oh, like, yeah. So, so it's like, uh, you know, like, you know, no splash or like little splash um, yeah. looks good to me. They turn a bunch of things, you know, like, so um, I, I think because I don't know the, the intricacies of diving, I'll probably give it a B, but, but definitely fun. And I mean, like that, that belly flop or like, you know, they try to like tuck in their leg, but then they can't grab one of the legs and they just like, you know, land <laughs> on, the, just, on the back. They go full sidewinder and just like <laughs> yeah. totally lose their form and just like, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. no, I agree. And when shout out to the, like the broadcasting crews or whatever, cause like as somebody that's been watching the Olympics for, you know, 30 years, give or take, um, nowadays when they like the commentators will like pause the video or like do the, like the slow motion and like explain why they like lose points and stuff like that because they, they show their form and they actually explain it, which I think is helpful. I, it just baffles me that people can see that in real time. Right. Yeah. Like I can't believe it. All right. Moving on Vince. Uh, how do you feel about uh, just, we're going to group a whole bunch of things together, but we're going to say, maybe you can give the definition athletics. Yeah. I mean, th this is how actually I went on the Olympics website and that's how they grouped it. And I was like, this is not helpful for me because yeah. like, because athletics literally is everything within track and field. Right. So like, so like, you know, shot put or like um, long, like not long, long distance running, like marathon, I think it's a separate one, but like anything that's like, you know, a thousand meters, 2000 like sprinting meters, sprinting or, or, or down all the way to a hundred meters. Right. So right. Um, I mean, athletics is, I think like if we go back to the, the roots of Olympics is like the heart of Olympics. Yeah. Um, I would give it an A um, for, for certain events. So let's just say like a hundred meter sprint, like, you know, with back, back when you sing Bolt was running, like that was like electrifying, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and I think Canadians um, did pretty well in terms of, you know, the hundred meters and 200 meters and whatnot. Um, the long distance running, uh, like I just can't like, like I would watch the final part, like the kick, but like if it's gonna take you over, you know, thirty minute of running, like I, I just can't. It's just like NASCAR, right? Like just driving around. Yeah. But like without the prospect of crashes. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> so, it's just, so like I mean, like if we go go to like I should say the winter sport, like I love, like I I enjoy speed skating because they they wipe out a lot. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But with athletics, like the running portion, I like the short distance is good. So that's an A, but like the longer distance, I might have to put it to like a B and then like the high jumps and stuff like that. Like that to me, I, I enjoy those, like the high yeah. jumps, the long jumps and whatnot. So, yeah, yeah. I, I agree that. So first of all, it's way too broad of a topic to give a fair grade. I'm going to, I'm going to go against the grain a little bit though. So like you were really nice when you said long distance running is like a B. Uh, long distance running brother is, is F for me. I I'm sorry. Like I, first of all, I don't run, uh, nor do I run particularly fast, but like in terms of watching or like whatever, I, 
I can't do it. It's un, it's unwatchable. So like that's the kind of thing that like if it's on, that's an instant turn off for me or like flip over to something else. And no disrespect to the achievement. It's like the Tour de France, right? Like people love the Tour de France and and all the power to them. But like I can't watch the Tour de France. Like what am I what am I watching? I'm not really watching anything. Now sometimes you can get a crash in the Tour de France, but whatever. Long distance running for me can't do it. And then the short distance running. I am going to agree with you when you say, I would think, I think maybe we're both in agreement that the hundred meter dash finals is like the pinnacle of the Olympics. I'm pretty sure there is no event. I think universally across all viewers, across all like countries, hundred meter dash finals is like you win gold in that. It's like you won the Olympics. Okay. It's like the most impactful gold medal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I agree. So sprinting for me is C at best. Okay. Even knowing that, and I'll still watch it. I'll still watch the hundred meter dash final because everybody does, but sprinting for me is it's like less painful, long distance running. It's over fast. Everybody's really bunched together. Like you're more just kind of watching to see who faults off the start line to see if there's any false starts or anything like that. And like, I mean, like Usain Bolt is a freak of nature and like, It's incredible, especially like you say, like, oh, Michael Phelps won like a trillion gold medals. Look at him. He's so good. And Usain Bolt on a gold medal count is considerably less, right? But to win the 100 meter and the 200 meter in back to back to back Olympics, like eight years apart, is probably one of the greatest athletic achievements in the history of mankind. Like it's actually insane, especially as as the body ages and, and depending on what you're participating in. So Anyway, athletics for me, I'm going to give it like a C, maybe a C minus will go down to like D because like there's like shot put is cool. High jump is cool. Like pole vault. That's wicked. Uh, and I'll watch like long jump or high jump. But like at the end of the day, uh, for yeah. me, if, if there's something else on, I'm probably going to flip it away to something else. And also like, it's just so hard to, to get a good gauge on when these events are going to be like on TV because they don't last very long, right? Like the pole vault, it just kind of like happens, but there's some stuff that's on all the time. Like if you don't turn on the winter Olympics and curling is on, like what the hell is going on? Right? Like it lasts the whole time. So <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So. All right. The next one is um, martial arts or combat. So that includes boxing, karate, judo, wrestling, Taekwondo. <sighs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I'm not a I'm not a combat, I'm not a combat guy. Um, I I think boxing is interesting. I have never paid for a pay per view boxing match, Floyd Mayweather uh, involved or not, uh, Jake Paul involved or not, or was it Logan Paul? I can't remember. Logan Paul, I think. What a what a is this like Elon Musk, 2021? <laughs> another one of our top influencers, Logan Paul. Please, oh my god. Okay, so like no, I I've, I've never watched any of that. I'm not a UFC guy. Although I understand that uh, the events in the Olympics are considerably different. And at the end of the day, if I watch things like judo or taekwondo, I have no idea what's going on. Like I'm like, I, and, and this is ignorance, like, you know, vanilla white boy, I've never watched or learned. Um, it's part of the reason that I don't like sports like basketball. And I didn't like football until I like started playing fantasy because I just didn't understand it. I think that I would, I would like it better if I understood it. But at this point in my life, I have no idea what's going on. So I'm going to give martial arts a low grade, uh, no disrespect again. I'm going to give it a D. I'm not a, I'm not a martial arts guy. I I'm completely in line with you. Um, just a shout out to karate. I think this is the first time they're in the Olympics. So that's that, but I mean, I don't understand most of it um yeah like i just can't watch it so yeah so i'll give it a d all right uh how do you feel about canoeing or rowing any of those kind of paddle based races first of all i didn't know canoeing was an olympic sport i thought i, didn't know that either. I, I thought canoeing was just a leisurely thing that we do in a camping trip yeah um, <laughs> um but definitely rowing i would give it a b uh, i think the canadians do fairly well um we we back back i don't know last olympic or two olympics ago what we actually had mcmaster people represents the rowing team um i don't remember yeah. his name though but you know like so so um it's exciting uh, again like if it's like i would only watch the finals so so like yeah you know, like I, I don't watch the heat or anything right so yeah. um I, I could see how hard they work i could see you know like just how jacked they are but Eh, you know, like I, I would give it a solid C. Yeah. 
I'd give it a C2. I agree. I would watch it if there was nothing better on, as opposed to something like, honestly, like long distance running, which if there's nothing better on, then I'm not watching anything, right? So like, I would watch it if it's on. So I'd agree with that. Yeah. How about cycling? Uh, yeah, long track cycling uh, or like distance cycling is the same for me as, as long distance running. I can't watch it. So um, I'm giving it the F. Uh, short track cycling, it, it could be kind of cool, right? They got those cool bikes with with no spokes in the in the yeah. middle, and they're just absolutely flying around in that that track. There's always a chance of a crash on the short track or like a wipeout. Uh, I'll give the short track cycling a C. It's I, I I'm very picky. Like I'm I'm such a, a plebeian with my Olympic sports, right? Like it needs to be fast paced and entertaining. I have a very limited uh, attention span when it comes to that. But I think short track cycling will grab my attention, kind of like the the boat races. So I, I'd watch short track cycling. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm the same with you. I mean, like actual cycling, like a Tour de France. Um, I mean, but my cousin really likes cycling back when you know Lance Armstrong was the thing. Um, but still, like it's you can't watch it. Like I can watch maybe like the final minute if it's still like competitive and they like race to the finals uh, to, to the finishing line. But like I agree with you, in, in indoor tracks, it's it's fun. Um, so indoor, probably a C cycling, um, outdoor or the, the long thing would be an F for me. So, all right. I'm glad we agree. <laughs> um, so how do you feel about, uh, gymnastics? Gymnastics is an A for me. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's an A for me. Um, my, like partially my kids love it. Like they, they just love watching it. Um, and I, like, I enjoy, like, again, um, like it's kind of like diving with me because it's like there's that judging component, but then that there's like, like obviously like, like if you jump on a horse or whatever, like if you don't do it, like I mean that, like it's obvious that you screwed up, right? So yeah. Um, but, but you know, like almost all all the events, um, is interesting to me. I I, I just look at it as like, hey, like I could never do any of this stuff. <laughs> so 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 I respect that, um, and. Like just, you know, the rings or whatever. It's just like, it's crazy to me. So, um, and p- part of it, it's, it's aesthetically pleasing, um, you know, balancing beams, the, the floor routine, all that stuff. So, yeah. so I would give it an A. Um, like I would, like literally we would just turn on TV and, and me and my kids would sit and watch because they like it and, and, and yeah. like, I don't mind it. So Yeah, I, I, I... Not going to go quite as high as an A, but I do agree that the gymnastics can be entertaining, uh, especially like, yeah, you said things like the rings or like the offset bar, like yeah, the offset oh. bars when they're doing like the friggin' flippies between those things and like jumping around and doing this crazy stuff. I'm like, that is, it's like Spider-Man, right? Like, yeah. and you know, that's, that's pretty cool. The floor routines can be cool. And, and you're right. Is there a sport? And, and we, we know this, right? Like as a society, we understand we are living in a society. No. But as a society, we understand that that gymnastics has an insane amount of pressure on on the athletes, especially because your your lifespan as an athlete in gymnastics is so short um, because of you know the required flexibility and and you know basically bounciness of with which you can just like fly around and like it's fine. But is there a more um, like under the microscope event than like the gymnastics floor routine, like in terms of pressure of screwing up or like dismounting from the bars, is there a moment other than maybe the final, like the hundred meter dash final or maybe like a diving final, but I would say not really, but is there a moment more high pressure or full of anticipation than watching somebody dismount on the bars or something and try to stick the landing than in like in gymnastics. And I don't think there is, it's like so intense. So I'm going to give gymnastics a B uh, because I would definitely watch it. I would definitely watch diving before that though, um, if it was on, which is, which seems like a little bit crazy um, now that I think about it, but I think, I think I honestly would, I would rather watch diving, but um, no, I, I'll definitely watch gymnastics before diving. Yeah. So there you go. The next one, equestrian. We talked a little bit about this with Noel. So, what are what's your take on equestrian? Uh, <sighs> <sighs> well, you know, like oh, that wasn't like a like a this is terrible. That was a like I don't know what to say. Um, so I don't want to go against Noel. I I don't know it. Again, it's it's one of those things where like 
I don't understand what goes into it. Uh, maybe because I'm not vanilla enough of a white boy to have like uh, ridden horses growing up, you know, like uh, some some high class, you know, stuff with access to a stable or something. But um, no disrespect to Noel, obviously. But I have uh, I don't I don't really I don't really have any draw to equestrian. I think it's cool. I think the, the horses are cool. Um, I, I do think that it's impressive what they do, but at the end of the day, like, I don't know, it's not great. So for me, equestrian is like a C or a D. Like I'd watch it if it was on it's again, it's better than running or, or long distance biking. I would watch it if it's on because it's somewhat fast paced and you get to see the scores and stuff right away. So it's, it's watchable, but not, not good for me. So, I mean, I, I don't know about horses, right? Um, and, and my, my biggest question is like, and I don't know what goes into like jockeys, right? Like I, I have no idea, but are we judging the animal or are we judging the human? What? Fair, <laughs> fair point. I think you're, you're judging the synergy, right? Yeah. Right. And, and like to, to me, I mean, all the other Olympic sports is like, you know, like human, like, you know, like, 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 you know, how, how fast you run, how high you jump and things like that. And now we, we, I mean, no disrespect to animals, right? Like, like animals are cool. Don't worry. I don't think they know that you're disrespecting them. <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, but like you said, it's, it's still watchable. Um, it's interesting. And for sure, my kids would, would watch it because they like horses. So I'll give it a D um, mainly because I don't know what goes into it. And again, like, are we judging the, the horse or, or just the human? Or, or, I mean, to your point, the synergy, right? The, yeah, the, but, but still. The, the right? horse like, human. Yeah, there's factors. There's, like, there's factors there that, that are hard to control, right? Yeah. Um, like, you can't really control how the horse is feeling. Like, a, a maybe you can to an extent. But, but yeah. Although, I'll tell you what. After talking, after talking with Noelle there, I, I might give a question a bit more of a chance. She says that Canada's good at it. So, so that, that bumps it up on the Canadian content thing. I wouldn't have had any clue, but at least now um, I'll be watching for the Canadians if, if it's ever on. So, so uh, we're, we're, we're moving on here. We're almost at the end. So how do you feel about uh, weightlifting, Vince? You, you strike me as a guy that likes to pump iron. Uh, weightlifting to me would probably be a C. Um... Like I'll watch it um, because I mean, people are lifting like absurd amount of weight, like just just, just absurd amount of weight. Weight, but like I I've actually no like like I guess I appreciate how strong these people are, but I like beyond that that like I have no idea what 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 goes into it, like the snap, the catch, whatever. I don't know, yeah. like. I, like and, and I mean like my, my kids don't watch it so it's like like and I don't want my kids watch it it's like oh you know dad I want to be a weightlifter it's like oh, okay like, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> they don't have the genetic advantage on that one do they Vince? no well, <laughs> no so um I, I I'll give it a c maybe a c minus you know like I watch it like I watched the the last part yeah. it's, it's always interesting to see if they would snap something you know like like yeah but, but like the, you invariably they that, won't though, right like, like it's brutal like you oh know, man like, like it's one of those it's one of those things like a like a so first of all i'm gonna i'm gonna agree with you and give it kind of like a safe c uh it's kind of a weak like i don't really have an opinion about weightlifting to be honest like again yeah i'll watch it but yeah it's seeing somebody get injured weightlifting yeah. is something that you you both don't like okay like you know hot take right the heat exchanger podcast like you don't want to see it, but, but if you do see it, it's like awesome, but not in a good way, but like, yeah, it's like, a, it's, you just know, like it's like that train wreck. It's the classic, like it's, it's a feeling of like, oh my God, I just saw something so cool, but oh my God, this person like broke their arm while they were trying to do like, you don't want to see it. But like when you hear these, you know, you know, you get this like Twitter, Twitter feed or a YouTube video of like, remember that, uh, that player in the NCAA March Madness that like, oh, like broke his shit that, in half. Oh. Like everybody saw it. And even if you didn't see the game, you like had to turn, you had to watch it because you're like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. You feel so bad for the guy or the girl as the case may be in weightlifting, but like you got to see it, right? Like you got to see what happened. So yeah, you don't want to see that. But anyway, yeah, weightlifting, it's a C. Um, yeah. What about, uh, 
Oh, wait, uh, you're... Uh, My turn to ask you. So yeah, all right, all right, all right. Modern pentathlon. I did not know this was a sport. And then triathlon. Yeah, I... <sighs> I, it's, it's long distance, right? Like, so it's out, it's out for me. I like, what, what is the pentathlon? I don't even know. I know the what the triathlon is. What, the what pentathlon the is actually quite interesting. It's fencing. What? Swimming, riding. And then they combine the last two uh, with like a circuit running and, and shooting. And shooting? Yeah. Like, like a, like a laser pistol. So basically you are like a biathlon so like you're training to be like the man of la mancha that's what you're doing like like the like, historically this was supposed to be like like wartime training yeah and and, and this was what, what the modern pentathlon okay is. so that sounds way cooler than i thought all right so i was gonna say like in the winter olympics i would watch the biathlon just for the rifle shooting right yeah. and so so the fact that the pentathlon has fence so first of all fencing's fencing is pretty awesome i think like fencing is cool uh the dexterity and the reflexes and, and the technique is, is cool um the the shooting laser pistols lame if they if they gave me a real gun i'd be more impressed um and then they, the they did have real guns like two olympics ago but then they're like oh the the, the bbs are, are not environmental friendly so they, they just change it to the laser really oh. yeah you know what's not environmentally friendly freaking powering a laser either okay like come on <laughs> jeez um anyway okay so if that's the case i might give the pentathlon a try um like for the because like they'll probably bounce around between people doing different things at different points right because it's got to be time trialed right so they, they can't all go out at the same time like a like a marathon or whatever right so i give that a try uh i haven't seen it so i can't give it too high of a grade i'll give it like a i'll give it like a c i'm gonna give the triathlon an f though i can't i can't watch the triathlon <laughs> But I might give the pentathlon a try just based on what you said. Yeah. I mean, so so I have friends that actually do triathlon. So I can't give it an F, but I'll give it a D. You know, like like it just you're I just such can't. a good you're such a good person, you know. <laughs> so nice. uh, but the, I mean I've never watched the pentathlon and, and literally this is the first time I've ever heard of it when I was doing some research on this tier list. But it sounds really interesting. Um I I don't know, like, I don't know how I feel about multi-day events. Um, but I, I would give it a C because yeah. j j just, just the, just the vast variety of skills these athletes have, um, yeah. kind of, yeah, the, the versatility is, yeah. is commendable there. Right. So like, yeah, you go from fencing to riding a horse and then to like shooting a gun. So well, nice. and then the other thing, and the other thing that makes the biathlon in the winter so impressive is, is that you're shooting a gun, but you have to run in between and you have to keep yeah. your hands steady. Right. Like, yeah. I don't know. I have BB guns at, at my cottage or whatever, or at least like we did when I was a kid, I haven't used one in, in a little bit. And we have like bow and arrow up there too. And like keeping steady hands. I don't know if you've ever like tried going to a gun range or shooting BB guns, but like, it's already kind of tricky, but like, if you, like, if you go out and run 10 K and then try to stand still and like shoot a rifle or shoot a, a pistol, like it cannot possibly be easy. So yeah. Cool. Got to control your breathing and all that stuff, you know, like it's just, yeah. All right. We're going to wrap up with a couple of sports. Okay. So like kind of yeah. like classic sports, like North American would recognize as opposed to uh, Olympic sports or Olympic events. So first one, Vince, uh, near and dear to my heart, as you know, be very careful as you answer <laughs> this question. Uh, but how do you feel about Olympic tennis? Uh, Olympic tennis. So, so like with these sports, like my, my biggest thing is that like, so there are other platforms for these athletes, right? So, so where's like the other, like, let's just say, do you ever watch gymnastics other than, than Olympics? Like I don't, right? Like, no, so, you're so right. you're right. So to me, like, and like, it's, it's kind of not best on best. Cause like, I mean, a bunch of people have pulled out already. And so the, the, that's, that's where it's like, uh, like I would give it a B tennis is fun. Um, but it's like, uh, like, you know, I rather rather watch, let's just say, the French Open, Wimbledon versus Olympic tennis. Yeah. Now, now in terms of people pulling out, I don't think that's very fair to Olympic tennis because that's yeah. this year, right? Yeah. Like based on that. But I'm going to surprise you, probably. And the answer that I'm going to give is the same. I'm going to give it a B um, because I think you're right. I think that there is plenty of other opportunity as a uh, so so to our to our listener out there hi mom if you're still with us um so 
like tennis is my thing, right? Like I'm obsessed with the game, uh, with the physics, with the, the athleticism, with the, the mind games, uh, with the execution, with the technology. Uh, you know, I string my own rackets. I do all this stuff. Like I just love, I just love this game. Um, and I love watching tennis. So like Wimbledon just happened a couple of weeks ago, right? Like it's a two week event, middle Sunday off, although they're doing away with that. And I'm here to tell you. Jake's still mourning. So sorry. You're still mourning. Yeah, I am still mourning. Don't even get me started. But, um, but like, it's, it's practically a two week vacation for me. Right. Like it's, it's, it's crazy. Like I'll get up and like Australian open, you should hear my wife complain about, you know, late January, early February, because when the Australian opens on, I just change to Australia time. So like, I will literally just like be up until like I'll start watching tennis at like 9 PM and I'll be up until like five in the morning, just watching tennis, or I will get up to watch the night matches in Australia at three in the morning, just to, especially if it's somebody that I have, like, you know, that I like. So I I'm obsessed with watching tennis. Like my whole sleep routine just changes. Um, and, actually, and then you go to school after that. Like that's exactly what I do. Yes, I do. I do that exact thing. Fun fact, my comprehensive exam for my PhD was right in the middle of the, well, the Australian opens right in the middle of that. So basically I just worked on my comp exam for, you know, 16 hours and then watched eight hours of tennis and I didn't sleep for three weeks. It was amazing. Um, so, so, but anyway, uh, my point is that I, I agree with you that there's a different avenue for people to ex- express that. I see a lot of tennis already. I have a subscription. I see all kinds of it. And um, it's just, yeah, it's just not the same because like you, you want other people to have, to have that. So like, would I watch tennis if it's on? Absolutely. I will always watch tennis, but does that make it uh, like a good Olympic event? Not necessarily. Uh, so, so I'm going to give it the B. Um, also, I know that uh, people are withdrawing, but we do have a lot of really great Canadian tennis players, uh, like amazing, uh, truly incredible. We have more men in the top, uh, well, more men in the top hundred than than a lot of countries. We have we have a couple of guys in the top twenty, uh, where you know the number of Americans in the top twenty zero, right? So so like you know Canadian tennis is in a really good spot. We got Bianca winning the U.S. a few years back. Uh, she's she's a, a pleasure to watch. She's super entertaining. She plays a good game. So anyway, shout out to tennis, but it gets a beat. So. Yeah. All right. So now we're gonna go to like some new sports um, that is the first time showing up in the Olympics. So there's skateboarding, sports climbing, surfing, um, and then we we talked about karate already, but we'll talk about baseball. So yeah. Um, so so to your point. I would never watch skateboarding if not for the Olympics. I know that the X games are a thing and I know there's a lot of competitions, right? But like my, the extent of my skateboarding knowledge is Tony Hawk's pro skater uh, from 1999 for the Nintendo 64. Right. So uh, that's, that's basically the extent of my skateboarding knowledge. I think skateboarding is pretty cool. Actually. I I got a skateboard as a kid. Every, everybody in my town did Uh, is like the cool thing to do when you're in like the fifth grade. Uh, But I couldn't do, like I tried to like learn how to jump on it, like Ollie on it. And I, I can't do it. So I respect skateboarding, climbing. I don't know. I don't think I would want to watch climbing. I mean, it, it like, again, freaks of freaks of nature to like hang on by one fingernail and do a backflip to like get on top of a rock. Congratulations. Like that's ridiculous. Sylvester Stallone is jealous of you, but it's not my thing. Uh, surfing. I don't know. I watched Blue Crush when I was a kid, didn't we all, right? So I, I don't know anything about surfing. And baseball, I watch it like practically every day anyway. So it's nothing, nothing great in karate. So anyway, the new sports all around, I'll, I'll give it like a, it's, I think some of them are good for the Olympics and some of them are just padding it out. So I'm just going to give it a C. Um, I think that skateboarding would be the one that I watch definitely the most out of those. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say exactly the same thing about skateboarding. Like, the only thing I know is about Tony Hawk. And, and that kind of tells you about, like, the... How we grew like, up. <laughs> I mean, like, if, if, if the, the only reference is 20 years ago, it's like, you know, like... Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so, so skate, I, I mean, skateboarding for me would be probably a C. Like, I'll, I'll watch it. Sports climbing, I'll probably watch it as well. Because, like, I mean, I like to watch those, like, like competition shows where like you you like uh you know you know what i mean like the yeah, the, yeah. like ultimate ninja warrior yeah, and yeah, all yeah, that yeah, stuff yeah, it's yeah. like so so like to me like it's similar so so i'll probably give it a shot so so that that'll be a c as well surfing i have no idea like you know 
that probably would be a D for me. And then baseball to me, it's like, it's really not best on best. Like it's none of the best baseball players. So, yeah. so I mean, it is what it is. Right? In the middle of the MLB season. Yeah. You know? So um, that I, I'll give that a D probably. Yeah. I don't think I'll be watching much baseball. I mean, no. is Canada represented in the Olympics for baseball? I have no idea. I, I honestly don't know. If Canada is represented, I will watch Canada play baseball. Um, but again, baseball, it's not the, when I say I watch it every day, uh, it's not the kind of thing that I like actively watch. Like if I'm working, then you just put it on one screen. Cause I have like, you know, you stream it on one screen or put it in the background you can just listen to it. Or, or I love listening to it on the radio or when I'm doing other stuff like housework or whatever. So I still consume a lot of baseball. I just don't actively watch it. And I don't want to be like watching Olympics as a passive consumer, right? I want to yeah. be an active uh, participant. So, um, all right. Yeah, yeah, so you get uh, you get the, the generic team sports, and by generic, I mean the pre-existing is what I mean team sports in in the Olympics. So things like soccer, basketball, field hockey, uh, volleyball, and softball. Yeah. So I mean, team sports. It's like with soccer is like I mean Euro just happened, right? So it's like it's unfortunate. I mean. I mean, it's like that every year, right? Because every yeah. time the Olympics happen, there's Euro. So again, like very similar to, to how I feel about, let's say tennis. Um, like I watch it. Like my, my father-in-law loves soccer, so he'll probably watch it. That, that'll be a C or even a D for me. Like it's, it is what it is. Like the, I mean, there's limitations here, right? Like I think it's un, under 23. So yeah. you won't see the actual full team there. <laughs> basketball to me, like, I, like basketball is my favorite sport. But I'll, I'll give it a solid C. Like every year is just the U.S. just dominating. It's just, yeah. it's not fun to watch. Sure. Uh, field hockey, I I don't know much about it. Um, that would be a D for me. Volleyball would actually be a B yeah. for me. Uh, I, I really enjoy volleyball. And that's the, really the only time I watch uh, volleyball. And then softball, uh, one of my best friend's sisters is on the Canadian team. So I have to give it a B. Nice. <laughs> Again, you're such a nice guy. <laughs> Yeah, soccer. Um, I don't. I don't watch soccer uh, almost ever. I didn't watch any of the Euro either. I, you know, congratulations to Italy. Uh, good for you. I hope everybody had a great time uh, and all the athletes had fun. But uh, soccer is not my thing. I once, uh, when I was in Europe for a trip after high school, my grandparents took us on a trip in 2006 before I started my undergrad at Mac. Uh, yes, in 2006, we went on a um, like a Euro trip during the World Cup. And I was in, um, I was in, what's the order? I was in Germany when Germany lost in the quarters. And then I went to England. Excuse me. I was in England when England lost in the quarters. Then we went to Germany. Germany lost in the semis. And then we finished the trip in Paris when France lost in the finals. So I saw in three um, bars in the home country, all of their countries lose in that order. So that was pretty, that was pretty fun. Um, but yeah, soccer's not for me. Basketball, I, like I said, I don't understand it. Soccer gets like a, a D. Basketball gets, I don't know, gets a C or a D. I, I, apparently the Canadians really choked this year. Like they were supposed to make it and be good. And then they like choked to Ethiopia or something. I can't remember who they lost to. Um, I don't, do you know who they lost to? It's not Ethiopia. Well, what? I don't know. I, 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 I made that up, but I can't remember. They lost to they lost to a small country that I that I forget the name of. Um, field hockey. My wife loves field hockey, so Laura, shout out, Laura. Can you hear me right now? Okay, so she can hear me. She's listening in from the other room. I don't understand field hockey, so she she played it. I've I've watched her games. I have a handle on the rules now, at least. But like, I don't know. I, there's too many whistles for me, so I'm gonna give it a C. Uh, I'll like, I'm sure Laura would want to watch it. So I'd watch it with her. Volleyball's fun. I'll give it a B. That could be cool. Like beach volleyball can be pretty intense, right? Like some of those, some of those games are crazy and softball. I don't know. I like playing softball, but I've never actually watched like softball at the Olympics before. So I'm going to give it like a, I'm going to give it a C minus C to D. Like if it's on, I'll probably watch it, but I'd like never remember turning on the TV and seeing softball. Um, last but not least, Vince. Golf. Yeah. How do you feel about golf, Jake? Um, well, I, I like golf as a, as a sport. I like to play golf. I'm not good at it. Uh, I was pretty, I was playing well last year and I've taken a real step back this year. It really hurts. But as an Olympic event, um, eh, 
I don't know. Like it, it's one of those things. Like I, I watched the British Open this weekend, so like I like to watch. I like to watch golf. I think a lot, golf gets a bad rap that it's boring to watch. I think that that putting is is cool and seeing like people like Bryson DeChambeau or or as my brother calls him Brooksy DeChambeau, uh, just like bomb it is is pretty entertaining. But as far as Olympic sports go, I don't know. I don't think golf is all that high. I'll give golf a, a C. Um, it's like whatever. Yeah, I'll probably give it a D. Like I, I, I can't watch golf. Like yeah. I, I'll probably watch like you know, the the final like the on the eighteen and 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 you know like it's what it is, right? Like well, well, like the open was just this past weekend. You know, good for, for good for the guy. I don't even know the name. Like you know, winning two two. Paul Morikawa. Yeah, w- w- winning two major championships uh, on his debut. So it's like you know, cool cool things, but yeah. Also had a great shirt on on Sunday. Real cool shirt. I got to tell you. But, yeah. um, but I mean, like, yeah, that, it's a solid D for me. So <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. That's it. We're, we made it. We made it through the we made it through the list. That was a, that was quite the list. So there you go. Our, uh, our list. And Jake did not give out any S's. There you go. I did not give out any S's because you gave out an S for swimming. Uh, and I don't know. None of these, if I was to, if I was to, to revise anything to be like my top pick, it's, it's clearly diving. So I would give diving my top grade if, if we had that, but um, as the students will tell you, I'm, I'm reluctant to give out top grades sometimes anyway. So, you know, don't, don't even worry about it. Um, but yeah, that was fun. Thank you, Vince. Good times. Good times. Yeah. All right, Vince, I think we made it to the end. The first ever episode of the heat exchanger podcast. Yeah, uh, thanks to all three of you who stayed till the end. Uh, it was a fun time. <laughs> that's that's an aggressive number three. I mean, like maybe if we both if we both listen to our own podcast, that's that's pretty good. But yeah. well, I mean, I have my mom, my wife. That's two already. Yeah, I'd love to say my wife would listen, but I don't know if Laura can be bothered. <laughs> she doesn't take any of my shit. Um, yeah, but but for sure, if you uh, if you made it to the end, thank you so much, and also thank you to our guest Noel for uh, giving us probably the only actually valuable content in this uh, rather lengthy episode of the Heat Exchanger podcast. So appreciate that. Hopefully um, any of students that chose to listen uh, got a little bit of value out of that too. Right? So I guess we'll, uh, we'll do this again soon, Vince. We'll get, a, we'll get another guest. Our next guest will be someone from uh, a little bit more senior in industry or possibly academia to give us a little bit uh, more career advice, maybe uh, going into graduate school for, for any of our students that are interested in talking about that sort of thing. And who knows what will happen in the world by then. We might uh, see like a live Jays game or maybe there will be uh, some additional good news with regards to COVID-19 as things continue to improve. Yeah, stay tuned. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night, Vince. Have a good Take one. Take care, Jay. Bye. Bye. All right. So now we are very pleased to be joined with, I'm going to start that right away because I already screwed it up. Okay. Does Laura ask about why we're doing this podcast? My wife's like, Sam's like, what are you guys doing? Hey, I mean, she's, she's supportive. But. Yeah. I don't know if Laura's supportive or not. Hey, Laura, are you supportive of the podcast? She says, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Laura, you should be supportive of the podcast because you're my wife. Okay, I think we got her. (laughs) I think we got her. See, this is the kind of stuff that I wish we had on the recording. Actually, that'd be a really, that'd be a really good uh, outro. Like, you know, like after the credits thing, like you just like have that one soundbite and it's just like me arguing with Laura about the the podcast. Okay, so.